Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for coming again. Uh, it's awesome to have you. My name is Michael Frank. I'm one of the organizers of this. And uh, it's awesome that we keep getting bigger and bigger. Uh, I'm really excited to dive into the fantasy sports and uh, sports game panel. But first, a big thanks to everyone who helped out. Uh, first of all, big thanks to Twitter for hosting the event. This is awesome. Great space. Um, I know in the back, uh, Kelly and Claire from Twitter are uh, on the recruiting team. So if you guys want to join the flock, you can uh, go talk to them. Uh, a major thanks to our uh, sponsors. First of all, Squarespace. Uh, they're a public platform, an e-commerce platform that's really elegant. And uh, they were great and they uh, helped support the event. They are actually doing a contest. So if you tweet at Squarespace with our hashtag, Sports and Tech, uh, you're entered to win a free year. So definitely do that. Uh, big thanks to Thuz. Those guys are in the back over there. Uh, Thuz is a terrific app. They uh, let you know what's on when the game gets really good. And uh, Warren, their CEO, was on a previous panel. It was great. So go talk to those guys. And uh, finally, uh, cater to me. Uh, they provided the food for everyone, so <laughs> I really appreciate that as well. Um, so those guys are in the back as well. So if you uh, want to talk to them, they're terrific for catering, corporate events, company events, etc. Um, so talk to them. Uh, all right. Finally, there's a couple people who are really helpful in setting this up. Dave Collins is over on the uh, filming, and he's been a huge help in organizing. And uh, Jen Rivers, the uh, internal events person at Twitter, who also has been really helpful. Um, so thanks very much, everyone. So quick hand, round of applause for everybody. Okay, so last few housekeeping things. Uh, we're in the midst of planning the next few of these events. Uh, I want to do them as often as we can. I try to do them every month, and usually it's more like every two months. So if you want to host an event, if you want to be on a panel, if you have an idea for a panel, same thing as always, email me and we'll try to get you on. Finally, uh, we love social media love. Tweet, hashtag sports and tech. We'll try to uh, monitor some of your questions. We'll do Q&A at the end as well, but I'll try to ask some if there's some trends. Um, all right, finally to the panel. Uh, this panel tonight is Innovations in Fantasy Sports and Sports Betting. Three of our four panelists made it on time, so hopefully Gavin from Comcast will eventually get here. But uh, we have some terrific panelists either way. Uh, to my left, uh, we, I have Gil Alexander. He's a sports gaming, betting, and statistics personality. He's an MLB analyst for uh, Dr. Bob Sports. Uh, he's a, the host of the Betting Dork podcast, which is a much, must listen. And uh, he is a fan of the Redskins, the Washington Bullets, which I think are the Wizards now, and the Orioles. Um, to his left is uh, Guy Lake. Uh, He's the product lead at Yahoo Fantasy Sports. He was previously at Fan IQ at ESPN. And I believe he used to uh, write for the talented Mr. Roto as well. And he's a fan of the Patriots, the Celtics, the Red Sox, the Giants, and the uh, Hometown Warriors. Um, and finally, we have Brandon Ramsey. He's the founder and CEO of Fanfit Sports, which is a venture-backed social sports betting startup. And his favorite teams are the Auburn Tigers, the Carolina Panthers, and the uh, San Jose Sharks. Uh, so anyway, so we'll, we'll get into some questions. We'll go for about 40 minutes. And uh, then we'll open it up for Q&A uh, for the audience. We actually have a microphone for Q&A now in this center. So we can line up or see how it goes. Anyway, so tweet about us. And here we go. All right. Um, so there are two kind of major topics that I think are really affecting both sports betting and fantasy sports. One, surprise is mobile. And two is sort of the regulatory si situation. So uh, let's start out with mobile. Um, obviously, betting and fantasy were very different now than they were 10 years ago because of the way people consume media and the way people bet. Uh, how do you find the, just the advent of mobile technology has affected the industries you guys spend so much time on? So I guess we can go down. Uh, maybe start with Brandon on the left. Sure. So one thing I've seen which got me excited about fandoms that you know, I'm used to going on my laptop, setting up my team, doing my draft, and then on the weekend I have my mobile device and I'm just looking at sports. So I'm consuming content and essentially trying to talk trash, but in the apps I saw, I wasn't able to do that. I was seeing that I'm ahead and I'm using text or Facebook or other things to reach out and talk trash and say, you know, I just passed you.
you or why did you play this guy? And so what we saw is an opportunity to tie into these platforms, essentially use mobile to actually talk trash and close the loop on inviting somebody else. So instead of, you know, laptop all week, studying my players, going on mobile and actually having the communication that makes fantasy fun. So we build a mobile app to actually do that. Um, but on mobile, there's so much information to put on a small screen. You have to have some kind of technology that services the content you care about. So we put a lot of energy into finding, you know, that if you're a Skins fan and I'm an Auburn fan, so that we don't say, I think you like college football, search this huge menu of teams, find the one you want, and now go think about, you know, the fan of the rival. We essentially do the work to look through and say, you like the 49ers, they're playing the, you know, Packers this weekend, and here's your three friends who like the Packers, you should probably bet them and talk some trash. So essentially, you open your mobile device, you make one click, and we can steal that 10 minutes on the train, as opposed to you can just set it all up and figure it out on the mobile device, which we found is next to impossible on a screen that size, because you're trying to, I don't know if you're trying to put your weekend lineup on a mobile device, it's difficult. So that was kind of our tack, was using big data and personalization to make that screen seem bigger, as opposed to, you know, maybe five steps before you get to do what you really want. Guy, how does Yahoo Fantasy Sports think about mobile? So, last year we saw probably the biggest shift year over year in terms of shift to mobile usage. Um, two years ago, you had about 10% about of users were kind of moving to find as mobile only, meaning that, yes, they had draft their team on desktop, but once that was done, they were really just, you know, everything was put on the phone. Go to fast forward to 2012, and by the end of the season, that number was closer to 40 percent. So it was a huge shift. Now, a couple of things, but it, things happened over the course of the season. There's really one interesting day during the course of the last season that really where everything really shifted, where we saw a considerable spike in the engagement of our users. It, was really, it wasn't a day so much as a holiday. It was Thanksgiving. So up until that point, we saw a pretty good parity between the amount of engagement we saw on desktop versus what we saw on mobile. But suddenly, Thanksgiving comes around, and we just saw this spike. just went way up for mobile, and desktop declined some, but mobile really spiked. Well, why is that? Because people didn't bring their desktop, they didn't bring their, their laptops with them when they went to visit their family or wherever they were going. But there's so obviously games on Thanksgiving. They want to, you know, they want to do all their things and set their lineups. And then what was interesting was it didn't change after that didn't suddenly go back and revert to the data that we were seeing before. What we found was that people started doing all this stuff on their phones. So they realized, oh my god, I can do all this stuff. And then they kept going. And so we saw this continued increase in engagement for mobile. The one caveat I'll give to this is that by the end of the season, the people who are playing the most are the people with the best chance to win. So you kind of have a self-selected group there. So there is some, you have to keep that in mind when you look at that data. But the interesting thing was, it was this thing external to sports in general, just like, what am I doing with my life at this time? And that is, visiting my mom and dad, and I've not used that with those PC. So, you know, we hit the phone up, and that's really made a difference. So that's really helped invigorate us as we think about our mobile levels for this year. Uh, so G Gil, uh, I probably didn't give him a proper bio. Part of what he does every week is he spent a few days in Vegas every week betting and talking to different betting personalities there. And Las Vegas, among other things, has, I guess, legal betting apps. How are is sort of both mobile technology and these apps affecting the landscape there? Well, the mobile apps in Las Vegas simply do not work as they should. You would be amazed at how billion dollar corporations can't get the technology piece together. So there's an opportunity in Las Vegas for anyone so inclined to help out major casinos with it or major sports books or sports gaming companies. I can't really speak to the mobile side beyond that. Socially, what it has done for those of us who bet. And I would say even in the last two years, I mean, five years ago, I didn't have conversations uh, that I could have today, let alone 10 years ago. The fact that I can engage with folks about betting, this morning someone was talking about, is Felix Hernandez at this point an auto fade? Meaning do you just automatically bet against him on a daily basis based on the betting line? Five years ago, I don't know where I have that conversation. Today, thanks to Twitter, the engagement is great. And that's had two effects. It's sort of a double-edged sword. Uh, on the one hand, 
social media has done a tremendous amount for shortening the learning curve of square betters. What took years in education for betting uh, once upon a time, that is so much more expeditious now. You can become a savvy better very quickly now. There's podcasts available. He had no, no less than ESPN has their editor-in-chief of ESPN, The Mag, dedicated to sports betting with a podcast. The flip side of that is that your edge as a sports better, thanks to social media, is not quite as there as often. So what was, what the marketplace had tremendous opportunity five, ten years ago. The professional sports better knew things that most people did not, just based on the research. Today, because that information is so out there, it's not as if the sports books themselves don't know about that as well. So that information is an effect of into the line. So on the one hand, it's great, the learning curve is shorter. On the other hand, for those of us who like to bet, not as much opportunity. That's, that's really interesting, uh, sort of how socials, sounds like, has really educated the crowd. Um, I know, Brandon, you've sort of very much built an app around sort of the social gaming experience. And Guy, I'm sure uh, you guys think about social books and how to better engage people through those kinds of experience. How are you guys on the product side thinking about using sort of those tool sets and opportunities? So I think if you look at the fact that 35 million people play fantasy sports each year, but then in March Madness comes around and 75 million people play or fill out a bracket. And I just look at my wife who doesn't care about college basketball, and then the bracket comes around, she fills out a bracket, and for those, you know, 10 days she becomes a fan of a team she would never care about. And she knows the name Gonzaga for a week, and gets a tattoo, cares, talks trash, and then the rest of the year she goes away. And wins the pool. And wins the pool. And wins the pool, yeah, usually better than I am. And so, like, this casual audience wants to engage, and you know, looking at mobile and all these things, figuring out, you know, I talked to a lot of CEOs of prior companies who have tried this, and what they said is the over-under and the things that, you know, Gil and some people would understand are intimidating. The casual audience doesn't want to understand that the quarterback's mom is in the hospital, so she's going to be hurt. They just want to look at, you know, two logos and pick the team that they want. So we handle all of that, and to create a casual social March Madness experience where you can actually become a fan of a team for a week or you know, whatever, if hockey's going on, I became a fan of hockey because there was nothing else going on, I went to the Sharks game. So I think you can create fans, just give them like the experiences they're used to. So they're used to Facebook, they're used to Twitter, they're used to talking trash. Give them those and do the rest for them. Say, you should care about this because your friends do. You should care about this because you're from this college. And then let them go from there. And I've found that, you know, that light touch, I don't want to ask some guy I went to high school with what's going on because I'm going to end up in the long conversation. But if I say, your team's going to get beat this weekend, he'll accept it, talk some trash, and we made that connection, and it goes no deeper than talking some trash and, you know, having some fun. So I think that's, the casual audience is kind of finding that balance is difficult, but I think whoever does has a real opportunity because there's half the world's population are sports fans. And there's 500 million fans in the big four U.S. There's 3 billion soccer fans, 2 billion cricket fans. These people are there, they just aren't know, having apps in front of them that are social and engaging and easy, um, it's kind of hard to have. So, the way I think about social and fantasy is, is kind of, there's inputs and then there's, there's outputs. And in terms of outputs, I'll start there, I kind of think of fantasy as one of the original social networks. It was just very small and it was, it was very walled. So it was you and nine of your friends. And or 11 or whatever the number was. And it was a way for you, as you dispersed across the country, as people who play fantasy football, typically college educated, typically, you know, travel where jobs are. I'm from the East Coast. I have friends who live all around the country now. And I've fantasy I've been in for nine years and I've made up of old high school friends and a few other folks we met along the way. Um, and it's a way for us to stay in touch. And so we are most engaged with one another during the fantasy baseball season. Football just doesn't have to take off for these guys for some reason. I'm trying to um, So that's an output. The other outputs, of course, are like how you share what's happening, you know, within your fantasy. And what we found so far, the is that if I told this audience how I'm doing in fantasy and that I beat Gil, you probably don't care, and you're probably going to get mad at me if I keep telling you that over and over again. 
So what we're more focused on is trying to like just make sure we're targeting it properly and getting a sense of like who, how we're directing our outputs and doing that in an intelligent way so we're not creating we're not we're creating signal, we're not creating noise. I think that's a really a critical piece of that. I actually think that where social like places like Twitter and Facebook have really changed radically um, the fantasy landscape is a lot that's very similar to what Gil was saying. So if you go to Roto World, it's a partner of ours now that provides all the player notes for, for Yahoo Baseball. If you look at the, the source material for where they're getting their player notes, it is about 75% Twitter. Now it's still the same writers. Before it would have been a link to an article that they wrote, and occasionally you will still see that. But more often than not, the link back that you're going to see is the Twitter post from that writer because the writer doesn't need to write a 500, 750,000 word article to get his point across. He uses 140 characters. This guy's injured. You want to get him out of your lineup. That, if it's a fantasy writer, even if it's not a fantasy writer, a fantasy writer will see that, re rewrite that content, link and, and link out, and say, "This is this beat writer just wrote this." So. In a lot of ways, it really cuts down on the amount of research that individual users do. I used to, when I first played, I would subscribe to the Philadelphia Inquirer, the New York Daily News. I would go through all these papers, and I'd set up my Google Reader, and I would just read through that stuff, and that's how I would win. And damn it, I can't do it anymore, because all you need to do is follow a few people on Twitter, and you're going to get most of that stuff there, too. So I think that that's a, a radical change. You know, Facebook, to a lesser extent, is doing some of that as well, but the ability to consume High quality information in a very short period of time, much like gambling, if you know, levels of playing. Um, so, I think you guys sort of alluded to the way sort of mobile and social are making sort of products more interesting. Uh, so, beyond fanhood sports, uh, what are the other kind of really interesting products and opportunities you're seeing in a book on the sort of gambling and betting side, and also, you know, things that Yahoo's thinking about? Uh, if Gavin gets here soon, uh, we'll talk about. Uh, FanDuel in the daily fantasy is one opportunity that's obviously been funded pretty well. But what are uh, sort of some other things you guys are thinking about from real money gaming to other opportunities we might not be aware of? Uh, I know on the gambling side of things, I'm not a shill at all for this company, but there is a, a uh, company called Sports Insights. Um, how I like to break it down in gambling, sort of the stock market, akin to the stock market. You have your stock pickers and you have your folks who are very adept at reading market moves. And I like to fashion myself as a stock picker, and I'll be the first person to tell you I am not good at reading the market, but that is definitely a very valuable skill. If you can shave off five, ten cents off your betting lines, especially over the course of a season or seasons, that's a huge advantage for you. Sports Insights has a product now where they go beyond just showing you how the line is moving on a daily basis, where the big money is, uh, what percentage of the tickets are on each side of the game. They actually will alert you based on their 10 years of data of how lines have moved based on certain situations as to which direction they feel a line will be moving. Now, for someone who's making their bed in the morning on Sunday morning and you really don't care, it's not for everybody. But for the type of better who is willing to grind out a profit by sitting in front of their screen on a daily basis, if you're playing baseball or basketball, for instance, it's a very valuable tool. Perhaps it won't make you, it will trigger a bet for you, but it might take you off something. If I like the Indians, but it looks like the line is going to move against me, well, you know, that, that tells me, that really sort of indicates what behavior I should have. It's going to move for me, well, then maybe I should wait, make that bet a little later, I'll get a more favorable line. So there's different, I hope I said that correctly, but you understand what I'm saying. There's a way to get the best price based on that price. That's sports insight, so that's something that's pretty cool. Okay, uh, we, we have our fourth panelist, um, Gavin Teo. Gavin is a uh, venture capitalist at Comcast Ventures. Um, who, as I just mentioned, uh, invested in FanDuel, and, and I think before that he was at Zynga and worked for Microsoft and Xbox. Um, so anyway, so why don't we skip to you, Gavin. Gavin, we're talking about uh, opportunities um, within the sports tech landscape. You guys just invested in uh, FanDuel, and I'm sure you've looked at some other sports deals. Can you sort of talk about uh, what was appealing about that company? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience who would love to get I don't remember the check size, 10 or $12 million from you guys. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for having me, and my sincere apologies for getting here so late. Um, thank you, Michael, for organizing, and uh, thank you to my 
fellow panelists for their forbearance and to all of you for uh, allowing me to come up here despite being an hour late to the event. It's a bit of a, a tough drive up from uh, Palo Alto. I take full responsibility for that. Um, uh, to address the question, uh, let me just start by saying that you know, Comcast Ventures is a venture capital fund. We invest in a range of different industries. The sector I focus on is gaming. Uh, we have three portfolio companies in the space. Um, we're invested in Try On Worlds, which is a maker of MMOs. We're also invested in Addiction, which is a mobile app discovery and distribution platform, and uh, also a publisher of viral apps. And then most recently, we led the investment in FanDuel. Um, FanDuel, uh, for several reasons, was attracted to us at the macro level. Uh, daily fantasy sports is an innovation, uh, in our opinion, on um, the fantasy sports landscape. It's one that is still an entertainment product, but is able to generate the ARPUs that make it attractive as something that sits like, in between uh, you know, social casino and sort of social betting type games, as well as real money gaming, with potential upside down the road um, through, through potential exits into more of an RNG type, type space. Um, but at its core, an, an, an entertainment product. Uh, and that's what really kind of attracted us to it. Um, you know, ARPUs were, were very, very uh, appealing, and there was um, sort of an economic model where you could look at cost per acquisition, and, um, so, sorry, our, our poo for everybody doesn't know, okay. average revenue per, per user. Right, average revenue per user economics were appealing. And if you look at um, scaling that business through, say, paid acquisition, one of the key metrics you want to look at is cost per acquisition or cost per install versus uh, lifetime value, which is driven off of average revenue per user. And, and that, that model, that funnel, uh, was profitable. So that's another reason that we were attracted to the deal. And then finally, you know, daily fantasy, like fantasy in general, is a, uh, it's an it's a, it's a entertainment product that thrives on having liquidity. And, um, and FanDuel is one of you know, several uh, early leaders in the space, um, the, the biggest one uh, in our, the course of our diligence. And for that reason, we felt they had um, an early advantage in being able to, uh, to really attract more users through network effects and ultimately monetize them. Um, I, I won't get too, too into the FanDuel investment, but one of the things that I think is interesting about it, um, and I, I know a lot of people here think about, is kind of the regulatory uh, situation with gambling and the fantasy exemption. And just uh, for anyone who doesn't know, fantasy sports, there's an exemption that it's a game of skill. Very different than gambling. Uh, I don't agree with that, but whatever. Uh, anyway, uh, so fantasy sports for real money gaming is legal in the United States and gambling is not, uh, except for in a few states. Uh, so when you guys were sort of looking at the regulatory uh, situation, I know I was kind of random about them going into real money gaming potentially. What was your sort of, what were the key takeaways? Again, understanding you're not a lawyer. Yep, absolutely. So you're absolutely right. You know, um, fantasy sports carved out of the UIGEA, the Gambling Enforcement Act. Uh, and for that reason, so is Daily Fantasy right now. Now as you look at, um, uh, I guess sort of the player profiles and kind of the demographics of who, who's playing traditional fantasy versus real uh, versus short, short duration fantasy, a couple things jump out. Um, first, you know, as the play sessions start to truncate and you kind of, you know, look at a series of events that occur over the course of a day or a week, uh, it becomes more gambling-like in terms of delivery, right? And so one could make the argument, uh, which you know, I think you, you, you've alluded to, that it looks like, you know, more of potentially a gambling-like product. Now, we got comfortable with that for two reasons. One, in the course of our legal diligence, um, you know, it, it became clear that you know, in states where that's allowed, uh, there wasn't any sort of action uh, legislatively to change the definition to carve out uh, daily fantasy from the rest of fantasy. So that's sort of point one. Secondarily, you know, NBC is part of Comcast. And um, from a principal investment standpoint, we had already um, invested in Roto World, one of their properties of Snapdraft which is a smaller player in the real money fantasy space. So we were already kind of exposed to that principal risk, if you will, and we felt very comfortable you know, making a, a bigger bet along those lines. But really, it kind of gets back to, I mean, the, the real reason, though, is if you, if you kind of take a step back and you look at who are the users that are playing, playing daily fantasy, one of the pieces of diligence we want to look at is do these players more approximate sharks or they, do they more approximate whales? And by that I mean, um, are the people that are most profitable for, for your game, are they people that come back again and again because they're there to win, like a professional gambler, and take money away from, you know, sort of your minnows, if you will. And if that's the case, you have to keep feeding the top of the funnel with, um, you know, fixed customer acquisition cost, only for that to be ultimately transferred to the sharks who are winning disproportionately on the platform. As opposed to, say, if you were to look at a distribution of players, and they more approximate whales, you know, in my experience at Zynga, you know, whales are the top 5% who play, you know, the sort of free-to-play poker games of the world.
world because you know they're not there to take money out of the system. They're there for the bragging rights, the thrill of winning against their friends, and that you know that is a more arguably a more you know, valuable, more sustainable player base over the medium term if you're paying a fixed customer acquisition cost. And so we, as we looked at that in answering the question, how much does this look like a gambling product? We wanted more. We wanted more whales. We wanted sharks, if you will. And one way you can look at that is you can look at a normal distribution of players against win-loss ratio on your on your y-axis, right? And so if you if you basically expect an entertainment product, then you would have um, a distribution that's sort of centered around whatever the rake is. So if your rake is 10%, you know, average average winnings would be negative 10% um, over the course of you know, X number of plays. If it's more of a shark product, then for your top 10% of players, X percent of players that are most valuable to you from a from an average revenue per user standpoint, you'll see it skew to a positive win ratio. And so as we were diligent in the company, we became very comfortable that in fact it was more an entertainment product as opposed to a, a gambling-like um, approximation, and, and that kind of fed into our comfort level as well. Okay, uh, Gavin brought up a ton of interesting things there, from customer segmentation to regulatory to segment about Vandal. Um, let's first, just to start, sort of, uh, we'll try to finish up the new products uh, discussion. What are the new products you guys, uh, Brandon and Guy, are really excited about, whether you're developing them in-house or, you know, as fans really enjoying? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, actually, I, I will say that I think data things is a terribly interesting space. So, yeah, it's definitely good as the FanDuel team. I've got nothing to do great work. So, that's one interesting space. But since that's been, that's been talked about, I won't go into that anymore. I think uh, another space that's, that's very interesting is actually one that we're working on now, is actually not so much radically changing fantasy, but is in just expanding the sport offering. So the world's most popular sport right now is the other football. And right now, there really isn't a single dominant player in that, in that space. There's the English Premier League game, which is the single biggest game out there. If you want to see a bad interface, I urge you to rush out and check this game. <laughs> So that's a space that we think that is, is really big. Right now, people tend to think about um, fantasy as an American phenomenon. And I think by and large, that's true. However, what we are seeing is that you can make inroads to this in, in other areas. Uh, you know, we had a product on Facebook, and we still have a product on Facebook, on, where we had a fantasy La Liga and a fantasy EPL game. And what we found was actually we had a modest U.S. audience, about 10 12% of the audience was U.S. and everything else was international. And in particular, as you'd expect, a large, for the English Premier League, a large number of fans from England. However, right behind them, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand. So huge fan bases in places that we don't ordinarily think about as fantasy hotbeds. And they love this game. And they're, they're passionate about it, they're talking about it to one another, they're sharing information on Facebook about it. So I think to me, it's not, it's, it's, the opportunity isn't just in the technology spaces, who are the audiences you're trying to reach? And I think that the world actually is ready, and you have to meet them where they are, which is uh, soccer is a, is a game of salaries. It's not a game of drafts, so you have to create a metaphor that's appropriate to that. And it's the game that, you know, in the Middle East is hugely popular. It's hugely popular all across the world, South America. And so a lot of the emerging economies out there, we have an opportunity to reach them. And if we combine that with a mobile effort, then you're going to reach even more folks. So it's not about creating a great desktop experience as much as it's about having a great experience across screens of a sport they love using a game mechanic that makes sense to them. Right now? So yeah, I mean, I'll break down into two things. When I was in college, I had a bookie that was just a friend, and it would bet with my heart or who I thought was going to win that you, know, you couldn't look online and get all this data. Then when I saw fantasy, I realized that you know, it's just like Zynga, where 10% of players create 9% of the revenue. They're digging through spreadsheets, and I don't have the time for that. And then you have Numberfire and some startups like that who come out, and they process that data for you. You input your team, and you get out these recommendations that save you hours and hours of time, and you'll pay a little bit for it, where you're not paying, you know, I bet they'll be on Bendel's 100 bucks or something more, where it, with a casual audience, you can kind of meet them both. So I love FanDuel. Love number fire and the starts that are trying to like give me the data without doing the work. Uh, we didn't do FanDuel only because we couldn't get past regulatory issues. I mean, I was at another startup that was similar to the skill carve out, and you know, an opinion letter is hard to get past a bunch of venture capitalists because they don't like opinion; they like fact and, and black letter law. And then with EPL, have a relationship with Facebook, and they uh, we were in their homepage of the app store when it launched. And, 
quickly realized they have a billion users, which means they're probably predominantly international. So we had this American game, and I noticed 80% of the traffic was international. So quickly tried to move into EPL and realized that these second screen experiences, there's no timeouts, and there's no, you know, there's two goals in the game. And at the Super Bowl, there's 11 minutes of real play. And we have lots of time to set up and guess who's coming in with the next pass game. And, and, you know, European League football, it's a whole lot of running around, and I didn't understand it very well. And then I went to Brazil, I went to a game, and there's guys with AK-47s and no clock. And I asked our, uh, our guide, like, why is this? He said, people get so intense about the clock and the time, because it's all they have. There's either a minute left, or no timeouts, or no penalty where you know you have that one minute to make it all happen. So create a game around that where I know the next pass will be, you know, there's no score. So it's, it's non-trivial, but whoever nails that, and it's pretty obvious there's three billion fans in that sport. So, you know, we looked at that as well and just thought we, we can tackle what we understand first, which is the big four US, which have half a billion fans. And, you know, for better or for worse, you can watch two hours of football and really see about, you know, 15, 20 minutes of play, but it makes it easy for these apps to guess that the next pass will be, you know, the next play will be a pass or a touchdown or a first down. Um, but certainly, you know, interested to see all the people who are trying to tackle the, that huge audience of cricket. Yeah, great answers. So, uh, now we're gonna go through some questions that might only touch two or three of the panelists. So the first are probably, at least these two guys, um, on the left, and that's about, uh, Brandon had talked about it before, how there's sort of certain content and education necessary to really explain the games to people. Um, Gil is a writer, does a podcast right now. Guy used to write for Talented Mr. Roto, as we said, and I'm sure Yahoo turns out a lot of content as well. What, in order to sort of expand the pie and just like make these new products accessible to big audiences, what is the content necessary uh, to sort of assist with that? I'll, I'll start out. I mean, one thing is for Yahoo, one with something we've invested in heavily is making sure we have a stable of really good writers. And what does really good mean in the context of fantasy? What after we, everything you've heard already is it well it doesn't sound like it's that hard. All I have to do is go on Twitter, look up a few things, and I'm an expert, which honestly isn't that far from the truth. Um, so I think that the key is honestly be a good writer. Like that's actually a big part of it. I mean you you want to be able to find the most salient points. You do want to try to find things that are, even with all the plethora of information, find those nuggets that are that are particularly interesting. Um, but most of all, be really entertaining. That's actually a really, really critical piece to that. Um, the, the other thing is there are metrics out there where you can measure the accuracy of your fantasy experts. And luckily, we've done pretty darn well in that area. We've got people who are, who are pretty accurate as far as it goes. But there's a lot of variability in there, and so things can things can go up and down. But I think in terms of how do you educate users about this, there's a lot of, when you're a fantasy writer, it's very easy to make an assumption that people understand what you're talking about when you say, oh yeah, this guy's OPS is off the charts, and that's why you need to add him into your league. And people are saying, what? You know, I don't know what that means. So there's kind of almost two audiences that you have to play to as a writer. One is the people who you, whose respect you have to earn because they know the game really well, and you're showing them that you are, and you have your bona fides as an expert. And then there's the other side of it, where you have to like, present information to users who are really just learning the game. There's, you know, there are millions of new people every year for whom this is their first experience. And providing content to them in a way that's easily digestible and understandable is critical. Great. Uh, how do you feel about this? Um, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I, I know in my world, somewhat unsurprisingly, there's a lot of uh, hucksters, charlatans, ne'er-do-wells, and people have to be smarter about what they you know, take in as legitimate information and legitimate people, quite frankly. Gambling, quite frankly, has its, its share of folks who don't have your best uh, intentions in mind. No, I don't believe that. No, it's kind of true. That said, I think if you're trying to handicap sports, if you, if you sort of then, the one thing that's nice about podcasts, by the way, let me finish that point, is that unlike doing a write-up on a game, unlike uh, a 140 character tweet in this case, if you do a podcast or if you listen to podcasts, that's 40 to 60 minutes of content where people probably can't BS their way through it. And you can really tell in that medium who knows their stuff and who doesn't. So you can sort of enhance your your edge or your, your betting experience by 
being smart about that in the first place. Now, when it gets to the analytical side of things, baseball, for instance, fan graphs for me is just indispensable. And one of the things that I, you know, what I did on fan graphs, though, three years ago, everybody does that now. If you're not constantly evolving as a better, probably as a fantasy player as well to some extent, but certainly as a sports better, if you are remaining stagnant, you are, as the cliche goes, falling behind. So I think constantly evolving is the way that you maintain any edge that you have. And that's easier said than done. That requires work. People think it's a, you know, it's a quick buck that you can get. Well, over the short term, it might be. But if you're going to do this successfully, sports betting that is, and there's nothing wrong with sports betting as entertainment, but if you're a serious sports better, I think that evolution of constantly evolving your model is key. And I just spoke to someone three days ago who's real smart, you know, 27 years old, does everything by his model. And you know, I said something, he was like, oh, I'm going to put that in my model. And then he was like, do you do anything with height and weight? And I said, no, I don't do anything with height and weight. He's like, well, I think I have an edge. So the point of that being something as ridiculous as that, at least that's how it sounded to me initially, he felt that that was something that he could apply to an aging curve. There was something to that that could help him in picking games. That's the kind of minutia that professional betters get to. So it's, a, it's twofold. I think you have to really pay attention to who you're listening to and that you've got to really apply yourself and evolve as, because markets will tend towards efficiency. Um, great. So, all right, so now uh, thinking about this uh, sort of shifting gears to being a startup in the uh, goal topic of fundraising. Um, Brandon, you have first round capital as an investor. Um, you have two other big VCs as an investor as well. And Mayfield Foundation. Mayfield Foundation, very good funds. Um, Gavin, you are a venture capitalist. So Brandon, uh, starting with you, there are a lot of people in this room who would be very happy to take money from any of those funds. Um, I know you had had some prior experience before um, with those funds, I believe, in your prior startup, but can you sort of go through the fundraising uh, process for you guys and what was really key in raising money for a sports gaming startup? Sure, I mean, if you're gonna raise, like we did on a PowerPoint, we're gonna have a product you're essentially using the terms that Gavin used, ARPU, Arctow, engagement, weekly or monthly, you know, and kind of modeling that out and putting it together in a way that you're, you know, it's, it's like you've probably all seen, there's a big market, there's half the world's population of sports fans, but everybody who tries to raise money says that there's a $500 billion market, so you don't really get that far unless you can dissect it and realize how you can attack it and what's missing. So essentially what we did was dissect that into, you know, part of the 75 million March Madness, 35 million fantasy, the, you know, the data that these guys are talking about and how the 40 million that are playing March Madness don't have the time or trust and don't understand. Like, if these writers came up and even when I watched Fox Sports Sunday, if you have an them how often they're right, I would trust them more. Like, 75% of the time this guy's right. So we're trying to create that through the social graph to where we bubble up the guys that are right as opposed to the guys you should just trust because we say you should. Um, so telling that whole story and then you know pitching them on the ability to build a business and, and you, know, you have to have passion but see the economics of the business. So we had to put all that together and then you know show some proof points. Uh, before we get to Gavin, just uh, so one of the things that occurs to me is there's a lot, and I, I you use most of them, uh, a lot of really good products in this room, and a lot of them might not necessarily have, uh, let's say, even if they have seed round uh, sort of user numbers, they might not have Series A or Series B user numbers. Um, in terms of figuring out a go-to-market strategy and a distribution strategy to actually get your app to a lot of people, how important was that, and how do you guys think about that in terms of you know becoming a mainstream app that people you know know outside of these sort of places? Uh, we'll start here. For me, I looked at distribution as a commodity. There's the big Yahoo, ESPN, Fox, CBS have 146 monthly active uniques. You know, you look at Zynga Poker, who is doing half, I think they have 36 million monthly actors, they're doing half a million dollars a day in revenue. You can apply that and say, you know, distribution is a commodity, so what we need to prove is what they're missing. They're missing engagement, they're missing social and viral, and if we can prove that and plug that into their monetization model, the distribution of 146 million eyeballs is something that we don't have to raise 20 million dollars to go and buy. We can partner or have you know some sort of 
strategic type of partnership to get that. So we set out to prove that. I think if you're Twitter, you, you know, you have to build that audience. That's, you know, like being LeBron James. I think if you have a business strategy where you understand that you can't do it all, you can improve engagement and you can improve organic acquisition and then go and talk to Fox, ESPN, CBS, Yahoo, and say, you have distribution, we have social, and this kind of background then, you know, that's a meaningful partnership. And so it's more of a pragmatic approach. Got it, that makes total sense. Prove the product and then, you know, bid step your way to distribution. Uh, yeah, is that a model that flies with you guys? Or what are the sorts of models? I mean, that doesn't seem necessarily like what FanDuel does. Let's talk about that a lot. But what are the types of models that uh, make sense to you from that perspective? So, you know, I think that is definitely um, a very logical one and it makes a lot of sense. I'm a fan of FanDuel myself. I play it on web, I play Betcha on mobile as well, and I think that, that makes a lot of sense as a startup that's trying to find new distribution channels. Um, for us, uh, it's not dissimilar to some of the things that, you know, NBC considered um, when we you know, brought the deal in as a venture group within a media company. Um, you know, uh, there are distribution channels out there that are you know, more commoditized than, um, in, my, in, in my view of the world, uh, a fantasy provider's ability to monetize, and ultimately that value exchange has to go both ways. So I think if you're able to show compelling unit economics, where there is participation from your media channel to, to some of that upside, then you know, there, there are partnership deals to be struck. Um, I think it also makes sense to be able to you know, tell a story around compelling unit economics on purely a B2C as opposed to a B2B to C strategy. And by that I mean, if you can show that your your ARP, your ARPU or your ARPDAO average revenue per daily active user is, is high enough to sustain acquisition through your various social channels, and it's not just you know sort of acquisition through display ad, display ads and, and banner ads and sort of social media ads, it's also things like radio acquisition, billboard acquisition. And a lot of that we find is also you know attractive and cost effective. Um, then then that that's an engine that you can kind of raise money against and say hey you know if we get X amount of capital we can we also acquire users profitably. So, you know, I think that that's something to keep in mind. Um, to kind of answer the broader question on some of the things that we look for in, in any sports startup that we, um, that we evaluate, you know, clearly it's the market opportunity first that's big and clearly defined. Uh, I think, you know, within sports, you, you want to go after segments that make the most sense based on your product, some product market fit for a more casual type offering versus a more hardcore offering that have different considerations. And being able to answer that question effectively is part of the puzzle. Um, having a real competitive advantage and differentiation. So if it's a, you know, let's say it's, it's a fantasy sports platform, then it's being able to show liquidity in, you know, whatever segment that you're going after, because ultimately that's going to help to build a bit of an early moat as you go after users. Um, I spoke about compelling unit economics, and then the other two things I would say is having the right team, and then finally a fair valuation, right? And I think uh, if you're able to check those boxes, then there'll be plenty of VCs out there that are looking to, to give you capital to help grow the business. Great. Um, guys, keep tweeting. This is great stuff. Uh, so we're going to do about five minutes more questions from me, and then uh, we'll do some Q&A from you guys. So I can call on you, but also if you, uh, anyone wants to line with the mic, uh, we'll get there soon. Okay. Um, from, uh, it seems like to some extent we're sort of seeing this real money gaming and uh, betting converging. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about how it seems silly that uh, this sort of betting exchange model hasn't really been done more by uh, casinos um, in Las Vegas because they just it seems like they're leaving huge amounts of money on the table. It's an opportunity you know, for them to kind of mitigate their risk and also allow people to make bigger bets. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that and also if you guys could also talk about sort of how the ways you guys are seeing um, these two kind of worlds converge, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I could, I could do 20 minutes on that alone. I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, Las Vegas, at least the sports book side of things, they, they are a, you know, I, I come from a radio background. And one of the things I used to like to say about radio is no one's interested in doing good radio anymore. You may have noticed, by the way. Everyone's just interested in keeping their jobs. And Las Vegas sports books, kind of the same way. Properties in Las Vegas, they make 60% of their revenue from non-gaming, believe it or not. Of the 40% that are, is from gaming, it's led by slot machines and everything in the casino, in the main casino, on the way down as the house edge decreases. Sports books are still this little thing in the scheme of things based on their uh, entire pie of revenue. As a result, no one is really that interested 
in rocking the boat. They want to just keep their jobs and stay there in the corner, make their little amount of money, not do anything. It would seem that a property like the Wynn, for instance, just to use one that caters to high income uh, visitors, in order to differentiate themselves, because Cantor Gaming has 25% of the market in Las Vegas, William Hill has over 100 sports books, Stations is another, the list goes on, but there's very few that are independently operated. Someone from a Wall Street background, it would seem, would go ahead and say to ourselves, well, how do we differentiate ourselves? Let's cater to big time gamblers. I have a friend who managed a $900,000 betting fund last year in Las Vegas. Not once did anybody in Las Vegas at a sports book care to know anything about him, want to learn about his betting tendencies, do anything actively to make sure that his business came to them and them alone. And that is such a wasted opportunity. It's sort of like what your broker ought to be doing, right? It's, you know, if, if, a, if a guy with that kind of money is throwing that kind of money around on a day-to-day -day basis in Las Vegas, if you're running a sports book there, you, you don't like it. I know he's a Red Sox fan. He doesn't like the Red Sox at minus 140. But if that Red Sox price goes to minus 135 later in the day, why wouldn't I call that guy and make sure that all the business I get is, is hit is mine, all his business is mine? So that's just how it's an inefficient place, Las Vegas, and it's done because people are just more concerned about not rocking the boat, not taking risks. It's very similar to lots of industries, but you'd be shocked that it happens in the huge business that is Las Vegas and sports betting specifically. Uh, do any other guys have answers about this? So I saw an interesting data point like that, and whenever we were starting to it, I was gonna take my lead designer and slide the Great Valley to Vegas to a sports book and look at it and say, how do we recreate this? And, I was there for a conference, and when I went to the sports book, I realized we're not going to be able to recreate this. This is not like a fun, social, casual environment. It's hardcore people smoking cigars, looking at the over under, and then saw you know Slotomania and Playtica being bought by real money gaming firms, realizing that the legislation wind is blowing that way, and found out that slot machines, you know, in the valley, we're, we're so used to A/B testing. In, in a casino, you can't eat A/B test a slot machine, and they were actually able to use this free premium slot game to test concepts online that they then turned into physical slot machines in their casinos and actually backed out for them for that alone. But they have this massive audience that, you know, if the legislation does change, they can just rip out the virtual economy and put it in real. But they already got their value back out of just sheer A-B testing concepts for slot machines, which blew my mind that it's kind of just the human economics or something that simple. And they got their money back on, you know, it was a hundred and eighty million and a five hundred million dollar acquisition of these companies. So the numbers are big and disruption is right. And it's just kind of thinking outside of the box and realizing to so what you said, like how do they evolve? How do they engage? Like most people that go there, they make their money off of aren't the hardcore gamblers who live here. So that's super interesting. Okay, uh, last question before we get to uh, Q and A for the audience. So uh, I think one of the questions that uh, like my like parents will ask when I tell them we do these events, is okay, so how does this stuff affect me as like, you know, sort of more of a mainstream sports fan? So I mean, I can tell you like, I'm pretty excited about in like gambling, by the idea of sort of more real time stuff, more like pitch by pitch every half inning. Cause you know, I like the idea that this is sort of continued game and not just like something you do before the game or when you get the overnights. What is the stuff that affect, that you think is gonna make this the best for fans and for yourselves going forward? I do think that the moving forward, the opportunity will be in the in-game stuff. Now, that goes counter to something somebody said on my podcast two weeks ago, a big-time professional player in Las Vegas, who says that the whole thing is rigged anyway. So you might, want, you might not want to do it there. He claims that they're actually listening to a radio feed. By the time you're making your wager, you've lost already. Trust me. Even if you were right, they'll wipe the bet off the board. So that's a fun opinion. If you're doing it online, you should be if you're doing it online, I do think that there is a huge opportunity in the ability to come up with a database that gives you an advantage in terms of historical outcomes, in terms of certain situations in ball games at specific times, situations, a couple runners on base, one out, this team down 3-2. That is an unexploited market. Um, and while everybody's doing, you know, full game wager where they're placing their bets prior to the game, um, that's where it hasn't really been fleshed out in this country. Now in Britain, over 50% of their handle is on in-game stuff. 
Americans aren't yet there. And that's, if you're, if you're a burgeoning sports better, and you are saying, which, where should I really attack first and foremost, that might be a good idea. So the, the question is about what your mom and dad think about how do I make money in that fantasy. Then, I mean, I think there's, I don't know if that's true. Oh, sorry. I think my question was, what, what gets you most excited about what's going on in fantasy? Okay, fair enough. Um, I think that, obviously, I think that a lot of stuff that's going on in mobile is, is terribly exciting. I think the, the solving the problem of a complex data set and putting it on a small screen is really interesting. We're, there's very interesting stuff going on. Yeah, in our house at Yahoo, and I've seen a lot of small startups starting to do interesting stuff there as well. Um, one place is doing some online that I'm a huge fan of, but they haven't transferred over the small screens. There's a little company called StatMilk. StatMilk is doing a really interesting stuff with data visualization. Um, I'm just a big fan of like, you know, one thing about fans is a lot of people play it, but how many of them are actually good at math? Not so many, you know, as it turns out, which is why they go turn to fantasy experts. So, one way to make things, you know, whether they're in you know, math is a question as well. But the, the other, the, the thing that helps them is, is thinking on data visualization. How can I just quickly grasp where am I weak, where am I strong in my team? And I don't think Yahoo right now is doing a very good job. I don't think anybody's doing a very good job. I think that's an area that can be exploited. So you know, literally design and the ability to visualize data in a clean, easy to understand way, assuming that your user is not advanced beyond a pie chart and a bar graph in terms of understanding things. So how do you take really simple graphical mechanics and hand them off to a user and then communicate more complicated ideas? And I think that's a really fun and interesting problem to solve that I think is, will, be, will be solved for Okay, Brandon. I think when you say what does it matter, what excites me is the fact that, you know, I was a young for you big data, trying to figure out these huge data sets, so that's my passion, but looking at sort of stats just about a company that uses camera technology, and it's, it's not out there yet, but the NBA teams are actually licensing this and using it to better their players, and the camera can tell you, the best example is a football play where there's a hole here and the guy went that way, he can dissect that and say, how often does your running back make the right move? And then they coach their players and teach them what they should have done, and interestingly enough, like in the NBA, LeBron James is like 90% accurate. He like could not have done something else to you know make the decision, which is awesome. The technology of some camera realizing that there was an open spot here could do that. If you apply that into these games, where I don't have to be an expert with a spreadsheet, but you're giving this data to me in a digestible format, I'm gonna have more fun because now I can compete with these guys who spend you know all day looking through this, and I can pay a little bit more for that advantage. But the win is what's fun, and when I bet a friend ten bucks, it's not the ten dollars; it's the fact that he had to reach into his wallet and give him ten bucks. So if I can get an edge to you know get that good feeling, I would pay for it. I pay five bucks for it. So I think that's why it matters is because it catches all of us up to the hardcore people, and we can have the same fun they they were able to have all this time. Pay a little bit for it, but you know it's there if you want it. So that's what's exciting for me and why I think it matters. Uh, Gavin. Yeah, so I would say for us, sort of three themes, um, short duration fantasy is one, but outside of that, live betting, you know, I think we've touched on that already. Um, you know, five times the volume of uh, bets take place in game than, than outside, in many, in many other markets. And I think mobile has the ability to pull more of that into a real-time betting experience. And then additional live betting, when you're looking at kind of virtual currency, sports betting, and, and sort of more sort of social, um, uh, non-real money, I think, you know, there have been many attempts, but that really haven't seen, I guess, you know, one company really figure out what that product looks like yet. And I think as that evolves, there's lots of opportunities to kind of um, fill the gaps in between periods of great content of sports with, uh, with experiences where you, can, where you can bet against your friends. So I think these are all themes that we'll see great companies and great products kind of you know, st step in front of and, and ride the tail with. Great. Um, I'll, I agree. All, all really interesting answers. All right, uh, let's now, we've only covered sort of a small chunk of the things these guys can talk about, so uh, let's now go to Q&A. Dave will pass the microphone around, or I can just call on you guys. Who has questions? Okay, in the back. Hi, thanks very, not, very much. My name's Greg Mann. I used to work at Zynga earlier days, so familiar with it in the sports industry. Uh, do my once a year Vegas trip with the guys, love it, gambling, stuff like that. My question for the panel is around sort of, I'll say customer acquisition. 
in the sense that the people in this room probably have some interest in fantasy and, and, and gambling to a larger extent as well, but in terms of broadening that pie, set aside for the moment the global stuff, which you've already touched on, but I'm just curious, how do you get someone sort of more interested now, and obviously the tools are available, to get them more interested in playing fantasy, if you're a guy at Yahoo as one example, um, versus sort of the casual person. You know, my wife, I had been managing her fantasy team this year, but if she's going to do it next year, it's probably going to be dependent on my involvement, not necessarily making her involved. But I'm just curious about the customer acquisition point. Thanks. So I think for us, exactly that, the social graph. I mean, Facebook is clearly moving away from spamming the whole channel to organic actions with open graph and the graph search where as I'm playing and I'm making opinions, it goes out into my feed and I get very little distribution, but if people in my graph engage with that story, it gets more and more distribution to where you get kind of free acquisition of people interested because I care and it's all around social proof. So being from Zynga, I'm sure, you know, social proof is the biggest thing there, but you don't buy a user and have them install. What actually happens is you buy their friend, They've seen the app once, they don't install, and then you pay to re-engage them once they have the social proof and see my friends are playing it. So Song Pop goes out and I saw it, I didn't play. And then I see all my friends are playing this thing, Song Pop, I've heard of it, so I'll play. And so I think in these social games and any kind of, even casual Yahoo, fantasy sports, it, it's social proof and seeing it happening where you're at and you're consuming and, and actually producing content helps you kind of drive your acquisition strategy when you're talking about pain. Kind of have to set it up before you can just go out and pay them because you can't really, with one ad unit, tell them what you're all about. So you kind of need that social proof, is what we've seen. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that at all. I think, you know, any, anytime you can have a friend recommend a service to you, even if it's not actively recommending, but they're implicitly recommending it, I think that's very powerful. Uh, one of the benefits of being in the Yahoo is we obviously have a large number of pages and we get a fair decent amount of data from users as they go through things. And so, as you, one thing that you can figure out who's a good candidate to target for fantasy. Um, are they someone who is looking at the box scores a lot? What kinds of pages are they going to? Are they, what's their, are they just bouncing quickly? Um, they see a, they, if they come from the home page and they see a story and they're there for a minute, that yeah, maybe not the best. But if they're repeatedly coming back and they're repeatedly looking at things like the standings, the box scores, the leaderboards, that's, that gives you an indication that this is someone who has a statistical frame of mind and they may not know about fantasy. That's exactly who I was when I first started playing. I did all of those things, and then eventually I got I got sucked in. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people out there you know, for whom that's true. So I think it's what are the, what's the behaviors you can see on or off network that you can detect, and then what are, you know, what are your friends doing that can provide implicit or explicit recommendations for you. Got it. Good answers. Um, who else has questions? Uh, Dan? Hi guys, my name is Dan Goldman. Uh, I'm a former professional poker player and sports better. And Gail, I'm a big fan of the podcast. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Um, I had a couple questions. Uh, one, why do you think the matchbook.com and Betfair model hasn't caught on more in the sports betting industry with the peer-to-peer -peer -peer betting? And then, second of all, as a guy who has access to some of the best handicappers in the world, have you ever been tempted to start a sports betting hedge fund and if so, why or why not? Um, I'll take the second one first. Um, I have not, but I was front row of center to someone who did last year. Um, there's just there's there's a legal hurdle that they're working on in Las Vegas right now, and it's about to become a lot easier. I don't know if you heard about the legislation a couple weeks ago. Um, and it gets back to how much money can you get down. You know, Mark Cuban famously had this idea in 2002, I believe it was, where he said, uh, this is better than the stock market, there's more information out there, you know if someone's injured, the stock market, everybody's cooking the books. And I actually had a five minute conversation with Mark Cuban a couple years ago at the Sloan Sports Conference, when you could actually talk to people like that for five minutes. And he immediately backed off, because he realized that when he had said it back in 2002, where he was sort of naive was in the getting down part of it. When you talk about the big time sports bettors like Billy Walters, everyone loves to talk about his skill and knowing which team's gonna win. His real skill is on his outs. The fact that he can get money down all over the place, nationwide, he has this network. So if you're doing a hedge fund in Vegas, Cantor has 25% of the market, William Hill has over 100 sports books. There's just not that much ability 
to really, you know, they're going to limit you. They're gonna, if you. And if you're successful, that's the thing, you know, they're like, okay, well, you know, that's your limit here when the lines first come out. They, you, so that you can't, you know, they, they put out a line, whether whatever sport it is, football, the best example, Sunday night, they limit that, the market calibrates, then you're allowed to bet more. So it's not the most efficient thing. And the legal hurdles make it just that much more sort of a, of a challenge. Now, that, that might go away. So it'll happen. Some people start doing that. I'm not the guy to do it. Um, and, I, and I saw the problems with it last year. As far as Matchbook and that market, first of all, I, think, I believe it's illegal from this country at this point now. Um, and I think it gets just back to the American better and the history of it. We just have not done it that way. I, that's a simple answer to the question. And I just don't think that there's, uh, when it gets to the, you know, the in-game stuff is a great example. They thought, I used to talk to Andrew Garud, who was the lead developer of the Midas algorithm that does the in-game stuff for Cantor, and who has been shipped back to London for who knows what, what reason. I think he was too smart. Um, but he thought that this stuff would be adopted within a year or two tops. He's like, you know, his accent would be like, oh, you know, American better will come in. Hasn't happened yet. <laughs> so I just think that's part of our culture. I have, you know, I have no better answer than that's out. Okay, who has those questions? We'll try to do a bunch of these pretty quick so we can get to most people's questions. Yep. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is for uh, Guy. Um, talked about kind Sorry, of can you try to <laughs> Can you try to make the best of one, just because I think Oh, all right, you talked about uh, the unexpected audience for EPL in like Malaysia and other countries. What, what are kind of the drivers and the engagement that you saw around there? And Gavin, you talked about the whale versus shark uh, distribution. Can you just, is that curve like fat in the middle and fat on the end for the other people? Thanks. Um, as far as like, the, the driver in terms of motivations, I just, to be honest, I'm not, I, I don't know exactly, other than we were initially surprised when, when, we, when we saw that, and so we just simply started marketing to that audience more and just saw a, a rapacious appetite for it. Um, we did see that they, that much like our English-speaking audience, not in this our game, are in English, and if these people are posting to one another socially in their native languages, so we saw a lot of Thai posts and such, uh, Indonesia was mostly English, Malaysia as well, but they were using the social mechanics, they were playing games with their friends, they were talking trash, they were asking questions about who should I start. They really, the behavior was very similar to what we saw from our, from our English audience and our American audience. Um, so I think that the reality is there just weren't many other games out there for them. And this was a sport that they liked, and this was there, and so they, they jumped all over it. And I think having it being on Facebook was something that, you know, was wide adoption, wide engagement with that, and certainly was Showing the and just started, started playing, saw the friends do it, and jumped on board. And the short answer is yes. For uh, a title that's um, you know kind of more RMG oriented, you're going to see a distribution that is going to be distributed around a positive win lot win ratio, and it'll be fat on that end of the spectrum, and um, the tail will, will will be thinner for for the loss for the losers. And this would this would be for your most valuable players, right? You don't want to look at it across your whole distribution because then if it will look normally distributed, you want to look at it for the players that are most valuable to your business. Okay, next question. All the way in the back, uh, by the Hi, I wanted to know briefly your thoughts on bettable or real money gambling, which hasn't really been addressed yet. Uh, maybe uh, Gavin or uh, Brandon, one of you guys want to take this one? Or actually, Brandon, have you guys, have you, Everyone, bettable, quick, quick, uh, like 10 seconds on them. They basically create um, a gaming engine an API that lets kind of games monetize like they had a gambling license, even though they don't. So it's, it's almost like gambling license as a service to some degree. Brandon, did you get, did you think about uh, using them as a way of monetizing your app? Yeah, I mean, but we ended up building it. I think you look at FanDuel is a targeted audience and they're whales and they, like, they have such big LTV. Have an ecosystem with some of these apps that have a casual audience that they can figure out who's casual, farm the non-casual into FanDuel, vice versa, acquire users into FanDuel, figure out the guys this is way too intense for, farm them into a casual app. You can do that, but you need the ecosystem. Building in the betting and the virtual economy, you know, there's a lot of startups that were saying everything should be gamified for a long time, but unless you understand a core game loop, just tacking on gamification doesn't really move your business forward. You have to have it in your DNA and understand 
what they're doing and be data driven. So I think first we wanted to understand that as opposed to you know put bolt on virtual bedding in. Um, and what we learned is, of course, we you know if we had a FanDuel app and our casual app, we would have been able to do that. I don't think Bettable would have moved that forward any longer because we needed the learning first. But that's kind of what we learned. Yeah, nothing to add to that. I totally agree with that. Okay, any more questions? Thanks. Follow up on that question. What is Apple and Google's take on daily fantasy and the kind of social contest? I've talked to Google. Um, Apple really, this isn't on their radar. I think they're they're moving towards that, but I don't think they're close to trying to start to attack these casual social apps. I think they're trying to get an ecosystem. So I've really found conversations that, you know, they're ready to jump into this. I think Google looks at team fit and reach. And so if somebody in this space comes out with some huge kind of reach and attacks an audience, I think they'll be interested immediately. I think they're kind of sitting back and waiting for that to happen in the space because it's so basic. Um, so we would be surprised for them to you know go out and partner and build something early. But if somebody hits it, I think you'll absolutely see them get involved. My, my take on <clears throat> Google, I think it's been really interesting watching them with it down over the last year, particularly where I used to always think of them as the place you go and then bounce from quickly to get to what you want. Um, so and, and to that extent on your search and everything else was really very platform as much like Apple we were talking about. However, what we've seen in sports very recently is they're shifting. And the model now is you type in Dallas Cowboys, you will start to get a lot of information about that, about that team right there on the search page so that you are not forced to go somewhere else to get that information. So that is not a terribly subtle shift for those of us in the sports industry who would like them to come to us. Um, and I think it's interesting to see like how far they're going to go in that direction. So it's, it's a tipping of the hand on one sense, but I'm not convinced they're willing to go all the way into games. But they're certainly going to they're certainly trying to turn themselves into a place where instead of going to Wikipedia, instead of going to Yahoo, instead of going to ESPN, get your just your baseline data there. So I think it's interesting to see where that goes. I agree a thousand percent. I think I was at a talk at Stanford four years ago where Google's vision was to know what you want before you ask for it. And they're certainly trying to go there. So it makes sense that if I'm a fan of Auburn and I bring in that they surface a game or content or a video to me, you know, Apple's trying to do that with Siri, but it's really about it. I was just going to say, I mean, the only thing I'd add to that is um, uh, if you think about uh, running RMG on top of a, a social graph that you're borrowing from Facebook, there is the platform tax, right? And for any transactions that go through essentially, you know, what is, what is today's iteration of Facebook credits or, or the Apple ecosystem, it's uh, you're kind of 30% down off, off the bat. So the economics to make it work on a single user basis becomes difficult, particularly if you're attracting you know, high ARPU users that kind of tend towards more um, from of the real money gambling crowd, which is why you see uh, a lot of these guys um, in the uh, daily fantasy space try and create their own social graph and their own logout so they don't have to pay that tax. But I think um, if you're looking at social betting, certainly, you know, um, I would say Facebook and Twitter, but Facebook in particular is, uh, you know, open graph is, is you know, very well suited for media consumption and you can use that as a acquisition channel as Brandon laid out earlier for your product without necessarily um, using the OAuth and actually monetizing through the, the, the essentially the currency of the platform. Great. Uh, okay, last question. Who wants it? Okay. Perfect. You guys answered everything. Um, all right, guys. Uh, first of all, big round of applause for our great panel. All right, secondly, uh, thank you very much to our host, Twitter, and to our sponsors, Squarespace, Thews, and Cater to Me. Uh, you know, as always, we'll try to do one of these in a month. Uh, email me if you want to be on the panel and uh, hang out and uh, have a beer now. So thanks a lot. Bye.